and Ms. French. Here. And then we have Mr. Hotchkiss. And we have Mr. Ferrara. Thank you. Okay. Agenda item number three, approval of the meetings from last month's meeting on May 15th. Uh, Madam Chair, I would move that we accept the draft minutes of the previous meeting as submitted. Second. Uh, well, the green, the green light is on. Yeah. Okay, we had a second from Ms. Lomas. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstain? Or, okay. Motion passes. The next item are any agenda adjustments? Oh, you're right. Thank you. We have, uh, I skipped agenda item four, approval of the minutes from the budget subcommittee meeting on May 28th, 2013. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to accept the draft minutes for the special budget meeting. Thank you, Mr. Moldaver. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll abstain, I, I did not attend. Okay. Oh, I'd also like to thank uh, Councilman Hoshkis for coming as our liaison to help us at the uh, budget meeting as uh, above and beyond the call of duty. Okay, motion passes. Number five then, agenda adjustments. I don't have any adjustments, but I do have an announcement at the May meeting, the committee uh, heard a presentation and made a recommendation regarding uh, uh, city stormwater ordinance and I wanted to let the committee members know that uh, that ordinance will be heard by the City Council's Ordinance Committee on Tuesday, June 25th at uh, 12 noon here in the City Council Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Any other agenda adjustments? Okay. Any public comment at this time? Anyone from the public here who would like to address the committee? No, seeing none. Moving to committee member and staff communications, Mr. Benson. Um, other than the uh, May 28th uh, budget subcommittee meeting, which was a noticed meeting, you just reviewed the minutes for, uh, I have nothing other, uh, nothing additional to add. Okay, that brings us to business items. First for the evening is the Water Quality Research and Monitoring Program Update and Fiscal Year 2014 Research and Monitoring Plan. Ms. Murray is here to talk to us about that. Ms. Murray. Thank you. Um, so I come twice a year for the Water Quality Program, sometimes for other projects too, but um, at this time of the year, I stop and give a mid-year update on some of our monitoring results and then go over changes that we have decided to make to the next year's um, research and monitoring plan. So I'll start with a brief overview and um, give some very brief results from our parking lot project where we are um, installing permeable pavers and the bird refuge pilot project and finish with the changes to the FY14 plan. And this will look familiar to some of you have seen this several times, but we have we've changed things a little bit. Um, our goals in our monitoring, our monitoring is very question driven. We want to quantify what types of pollutants are present and at what concentrations and whether those are at harmful levels so we know which pollutants to target. We want to always evaluate our project effectiveness and that includes collecting baseline data for future projects. We want to know where any pollution problems are coming from and um, we want to try to collect data towards answering the uh, question of is water quality getting better over time. We've added two new goals and I'll get into this more later um, at, at the end of the presentation when we go over the new research plan. Um, but we want to meet our grant requirements and those are getting a little bit more substantial as the granting as, as, with our newer grants. And then we have new general permit requirements and we want to have that meeting those requirements at the top of our list. 
And as always, we're trying to develop strategies and prioritize future projects and let the public know what is going on with our creeks and beaches and our projects. We organize for each of these um, program elements. There's a list of questions, research questions, and you have these in your attached research plan. And we gather questions from um, kind of our, our own knowledge and conferences that we attend and literature that we read. But we also take on questions that are suggested by staff from within the Creeks Division and in other departments throughout the city and from um, committee members as well. So I encourage, and, and members of the public, so I encourage anyone to come to us with research questions that they may have and then we can try to figure out how to collect the data to answer those questions. So as I mentioned, we're, we're adding um, these elements of meeting the grant project requirements and our general permit and I'll, I'll go over that. We have our general watershed assessment and that includes tracking our long-term trends, our storm monitoring, um, our restoration and water quality project assessment and some of that does take place during storms our source tracking, our creek walks, and our bioassessment. And you heard a presentation about that very recently. So briefly, the stormwater infiltration demonstration project, we've um, begun monitoring for that. And this is what I'm talking about here is the one that is um, uh, funded by the grant to replace the um, impermeable asphalt at the six parking lots, Stevens Park, Oak Park, the Westside Neighborhood Center. I know, I know you've heard a recent presentation on that. And um, the goal of the project is to be able to infiltrate the runoff and uh, as it goes into the groundwater, treat, treat it and remove associated pollutants. We have committed to measuring the project benefits two ways. One is to track the amount of rainfall that is actually infiltrated. And that is done by um, having a monitoring well at each site. And then we have a, a level logger that records the depth of the water in each of those wells. But we also um, want to know that the, the amount of or the load of pollutants that will be inf infiltrated by those projects. We want to be able to put some kind of number on getting rid of the contaminants and keeping them out of our streams. And so typically the way you would measure the load of a pollutant, whether that's you're tracking a load that's discharged out of a creek or a load that's um, treated by, removed by some kind of treatment project, is you would multiply the total amount of water flowing through your project or your creek and multiply that by some kind of average concentration that you've identified and you multiply it and then you get the actual weight of the pollutant itself. But the, um, the LID projects, the low impact development or the infiltration projects are tricky because there's no post project flow to measure. We just know that we're getting rid of everything. So what we're doing is, um, what we will be doing next year after the project is installed is um, multiplying the rainfall amount and we'll have visual confirmation that all of it gets soaked into the ground times a pre-project, um, we call it EMC, stands for event mean concentration. So this year what we tried to do was get that average concentration for each pollutant type at each of the parking lot sites. So in order to get an average, we sampled three different storms and we, at each of the sites, and we tried to collect composite samples whenever possible, so uh, up to three different time points were poured into the same bottle before we sent it off to the lab. And we tested, had all those samples tested for pesticides, hydrocarbons, metals, bacteria, toxicity, um, suspended sediment, and nutrients. Uh, here's just uh, the, the images of um, the Westside Neighborhood Center, and the red arrow shows where we sampled, there's a drop inlet right there that collects the runoff. You can see that in the picture, it's at night. It's a wet surface, so we're trying to grab the water there. Um, but we have that same kind of setup or something like it at the six different sites. And the, at, during the first storm, we did not detect any pesticides from any of those parking lots. So we, we discontinued testing for those because they're very expensive and I didn't think we were gonna find any. Um, we did find most of the metals, including chromium, copper, lead, and zinc at all of our sites. And in general, we had higher concentrations at the um, parking lots that had higher vehicle traffic. And um, we found the diesel range organics the, um, at all sites. So results that are representative of parking and, and traffic. And then um, mostly we had low toxicity and except for some extremely high toxicity in two of the samples. So we'll now, we now have, um, we still have some more calculations to do, but we'll have those numbers on hand for the coming year when we get, hopefully we'll get some real rain this year and can be able to um, provide data about how, how 
what weight of pollutants is being removed by each of those sites. And then the Bird Refuge Pilot Project, I th um, think most of you were on the site visit where we went out there last year and we went out shortly after we installed this perforated tubing um, in one section of the Bird Refuge and it's got um, a low energy air compressor that's creating um, very small bubbles coming up out of those tubes. And the idea isn't to aerate the water, but to mix the water and th therefore allow it to get more air from the surface or bring the low oxygen water up and just move things around more um, to provide more oxygen and reduce the stagnant conditions that can lead to some algae blooms that can create the really bad stink events. And we have gone out um, almost every week since then and we test the dissolved oxygen and other water quality parameters. Um, we go across, is there a pointer? Do we have a pointer? Oh, mouse, okay. Um, so we go, uh, we go across, across the tubing and then we have a site and we measure, um, sorry, we measure the water quality parameters at five different spots, surface and every foot of depth. And then we do that out, in the, out here in the open lake too. At a, at a different transect. So we have our test site and our control site. And um, this is an interesting picture because you can actually see that even though we just have those, that little bit of bubbling on the surface, it's actually creating like a surface ruffling all the way to the edge. And then between these two buoys, there is no tubing. And that area is totally glassy all the way across. So visually, we are getting some impact, some circulation impact all the way to the shore. And so we want to see if our water quality data support that. So here, um, this is the only graph I'll show you tonight. We have the average dissolved oxygen concentration, and this is um, from one foot below the surface. So we just pick, picked a depth to compare for all the different stations, and then I took the average. So um, blue is our test site with the tubing, red is our control site with no tubing, and I t there, were, there have been three different, clear different periods since we started. Between September and February, there was a very intense algae bloom. That's when we went out to the site. And you, you know, I think we tried to do the Secchi depth with the disc and it was about four inches. We call that the pea soup look. And then the water really cleared up, but the dissolved oxygen concentrations were much lower. And we had um, in March and April, and then we've, this algae bloom has come back in the last couple of months. When the algae bloom is present, we have the algae are producing oxygen. So we have higher oxygen at the surface at least. And we can see some evidence of increased circulation with these results because when the dissolved oxygen is higher on the, the left and right panel, um, the average concentration is lower, and this is gonna sound counterintuitive, in the treatment site. And I think that's because it's bringing up that lower oxygen water from the bottom and it's, it's mixing it around more. And we don't have that mixing in the open lake and so we get the higher higher um, oxygen concentrations at the surface. And then <clears throat> during the period when we had low average oxygen, we actually had higher oxygen in the treatment site. And I think that's, it was moving the water around more, allowing it to exchange oxygen with the surface. It's a statistically significant difference, but we don't know if it's substantial enough to prevent um, stink events in the future. And so we're continuing to collect data. Um, in the past, we've collected uh, a lot less background data, and then during um, during periods with the stink, we've gone out and collected more data, or even just visually. People tend to know what's going on when it is stinky, but not when it's um, when it's not stinky. And so we really don't know the specific. We kind of know the general pattern of what causes it causes it to um, turn, but we don't know the specific water quality patterns or the specific weather patterns that would lead to this. And so we don't really um, we'll have a much better idea of how to fix it once we have more data. So for the changes to the research plan for next year, um, we are going to um, do some source tracking projects. We're going to do some testing where we have had done the sewer line, where the wastewater division has done the sewer line repair in the Laguna watershed. You know, that we've, we've done all this investigation and now the sewer line repair, we wanna see if those signals of human waste are gone. I really hope that they are. And we're also assisting UCSB with a source, track, source tracking project that they're doing on Arroyo Borough. And then we also have um, grant required monitoring, as I mentioned, and it's just, it's more, 
it's just more onerous and uh, we have to submit all the most of the data that we collect to the state um, water quality online databases it's just takes a lot more time than it used to and then the general permit requirements they fall into two categories one is part of um, illicit discharge detection and elimination or IDDE and we will um, conduct an outfall inventory so this means a creek walk where we're looking at all the different pipes coming into the creek and then any that are flowing we have to collect a prescribed set of parameters so in a way it's taking a step back the creek for the we we did this 10 years ago and um, we'll be doing it again and this is the first time that we've been required to do specific monitoring the monitoring component as it's described in the general permit is really unknown at this point there's a flow chart which you have in the research plan and you follow the different steps we end up um, fitting into the category where we know we have impaired water bodies and that the source is listed as possibly from urban runoff and if that's the case then we are to consult with the regional board to determine our monitoring program and we have um, it's also in the research plan you can see which of those water bodies are listed with I've, I've highlighted them in red which are um, listed as having urban runoff as a potential source for the listing so we'll probably be coming back to you and letting you know what um, we'll be required to do I'm assuming we're not going to do that this year we'll talk to them this year and do the monitoring next year we also need to develop a state approved quality assurance project plan we need to submit specific reporting um, that they require and then um, we have to do data submittal to the state's water quality database as I mentioned in this it's um, we have an excellent database that we put all of our data into it. it allows us to retrieve data so easily for what we need to answer certain questions if we can just instantly pull up all the data from a particular project that we've collected for years it's worked really well for us um, I think we started that about five years ago and so we don't know if this can work with that or if we're gonna have to have two completely separate streams of the way we manage data so that that remains to be seen our lab costs will remain um, similar to years previous and this is for our chemistry and toxicity sampling this the 70,000 does not include source tracking that would be a separate contract with UCSB and um, and then the next steps are to carry out this plan consult with the regional board about our monitoring requirements and um, complete our annual report and come back to you with that and we'll be really trying to focus on um, wrapping up some data analysis of our restoration projects as we sh as we're shifting gears a little bit when I'm going to finish up and let the public know what some of those projects have shown and that's it and I'll take questions if you have any thank you miss Murray uh, that we always appreciate the detailed information you give us because without the the research plan you know and the the depth that you and attention you show to it we wouldn't have be so sure and confident in the the programs that we that we have so are there any questions from the committee yes I had two probably very simple questions um, this year you had to go in and, and figure out what the loading was when you were figuring out sort of the benefit of the infiltration will you be able to use that average loading that you collected this year into future years or will you have to do that each year to do a new calculation um, that's a good question we will have our chemistry data will be set because we can never collect that again because we'll never have runoff again and then all we have to do is multiply that by the amount of rainfall that we is infiltrated um, every <clears throat> excuse me every year oh and are you referring to future projects as well okay uh, thank you that's really helpful because uh, I was trying to figure out if it's getting infiltrated how are you gonna grab it so thank you and then um, uh, I noticed there was an incident on Cannon Perdido this weekend, Saturday night, where the, it looked like a pipe broke. And I was wondering if that was a sewer pipe, but it was a water pipe. Okay. I, okay. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Thank you for a great report, Dr. Murray. Um, in terms of the data collection for the parking lot at the West Side Center, I was curious, what are the two high-level toxics uh, that you found? Um, so the, the high toxicity comes from 
a, what's called a um, whole effluent toxicity test. So we don't know what compounds were toxic. There was nothing that, um, and it wasn't, uh, that might have been misleading because the results were from all of the sites that I mentioned. And I don't have it in front of me which sites and which storms. It was two different sites. One was, one, one was Oak Park um, and one was the West Side Neighborhood Center during different storms. And that, that's the, the great benefit of toxicity testing and we call that our second tier. It's, we, don't, we don't always know what to test for. We don't know how different compounds add up in their toxic effects, but we know that when organisms were exposed to that you know, plain sample that we collected, it exhibited toxicity. Is that sufficient? And that, just so I'm clear, those were collected after significant rainfall? Well, unfortunately, we didn't have any significant rainfall this year. <laughs> but we, collect, we wanted to collect them, um, we wanted to collect them in a way that would give us the true, as close to the true average as we could get. So what we did was we took the forecasted amount of rainfall and we divided that into three time periods because we get a quantitative precipitation forecast where they, they give us a, their best guess on when different amounts are going to fall. And then we tried to sample, try to divide that into even like, say our storm was going to be 0.6 inches. When are we going to get the first 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6 and sample in the middle of those three periods, pour all the water together, have the lab test it, and that would give us an average for that storm. Yes, Ms. Lomas. I just have one brief question. Um, when you're testing for toxicity, uh, what do you use as uh, an organism to test le lethal levels? Uh, um, this one depends on um, our question and our project, and we, so we don't always use the same organism. For this project, we used um, fathead minnows. Thank you. And you listed the, the chemicals that you found in the testing earlier, and one of them was chromium. Is it just is what type of chromium were you finding? Different types, or um, we just did total chromium, and so it, 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 they don't speciate it on that test. And so, do you have enough data yet to know whether or not the programs that are in place are helping to reduce the amount of chemicals that you're detecting? Well, that so that chromium result was just from that parking lot. Um, so that was just coming off of that parking lot. We know, I mean, we're going to put the project in. We're hoping that's all going to go in the ground and will be, you know, many, many, many years before it reaches surface water and hopefully will be degraded by the time it ever gets to a creek. We viewed the um, completed project off of Los, Las Positas. And so was, were any of the data in your report or in your presentation from that site? No, not this time. We have data, and we've put that in our reports before. But we were um, actually just talking today about whether we should continue to sample that site. I mean, it is infiltrating, so it's, again, it's hard to sample. But there are a couple of places where um, you could collect the runoff from the upper parking lot as it comes down. We decided not to continue that. Um, but I'm definitely open to discussing. And can I ask why? We felt like we had, um, we kind of know, uh, it, we didn't really have a research question that was going to keep us going on that one. Um, we, because we'll never get, and we will we'll never get the uh, average concentration off that whole parking lot because the, the lot is already repaved. So we'd only be getting that upper parking lot. It just didn't seem like a complete analysis to pursue. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments from the committee? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I, I would move that we uh, recommend continuation of the monitoring program for fiscal year 2014. Um, I was impressed by the work that Dr. Murray and her team have been doing, and I was actually very impressed with her last answer because I know that uh, Mr. Benson and Councilman Hotchkiss get asked when they're going to the Chamber of Commerce or the Lodging and Restaurant Association, are, are we doing studies and projects just for the sense of studying? And it, it was good to hear you uh, unprompted say, no, if, if we don't have a need to study this or we can't get good data, we're not going to put uh, staff time into it. So based on this report, um, 
uh, in those answers, I'd like to uh, recommend that we continue uh, the monitoring program as recommended for fiscal year 2014. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Seeing none, motion passes. Thank okay, you for your Thank attention. You. Thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Murray. Our next business item is the enforcement program update, and we have Jim Rumbly, a code enforcement officer, to give us a presentation. Thank you, I'm Jim Rumbly, and um, I'm a code enforcement officer for the Creeks Division, and I'm here to give an update on our enforcement program, and so sp specifically uh, what's been going on in fiscal year 2013, which runs from uh, the beginning of July of 2012 through the end of June of this year. Title 16 of our municipal code gives us the authority to enforce the city's water pollution rules. And this title prohibits um, many types of things. Um, some of the things that we see the most of are construction runoff, which is prohibited. Um, all wash water on commercial property must be captured. Mobile business washing, all that water needs to be captured as well. Um, any type of vehicle leak into the storm drain would be a violation and illegal dumping as well. 897-2688 is our enforcement line. That's my direct phone number. We monitor it during Creeks Division business hours, which are Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5.30, and every other Friday from 8 to 4.30. Um, if you call that line during business hours, you're, you're likely to get me. Um, if I'm out in the field, I'll forward that to my cell phone. Um, so it's our goal to investigate all the reports that we receive on the same day that we receive them. So far this year, when we've been able to get to all of them, uh, that'll be the first year in, in several years that we've been able to do that. This is a chart showing the breakdown of who calls our line, where we get our reports from. So far this year, we've had about 60% of our reports from city staff, slightly more from Creeks Division staff. Um, the other 29% of that 60 is, is from is from other city staff outside our division. And that's slightly up from previous years, and I've tracked from fiscal year 07 through fiscal year 13. The other 40% comes from residents or other agency staff, and that other agency staff would be um, nonprofit organizations and also the County of Santa Barbara. We get a lot of calls from them. And that's uh, those two categories, residents and other agency staff, are, are slightly down from previous years. This is a chart showing the types of discharges that we see. And every call that we get, we put them into one of these categories. Commercial and industrial is our most frequently reported category. And that's most of the commercial washing uh, that happens in town. For second place, it's pretty close between construction-related discharges, illegal dumping, and residential discharges. Compared to previous years, construction-related discharges and illegal dumping is up by about 5%, and residential uh, just happens to be down a little bit this year. Automotive category, which is vehicle leaks and automotive shops, makes up about 5% of the calls, and mobile businesses account for another approximately 5% of the calls. That's mobile business washing. And anything that doesn't fall into... Uh, our categories gets lumped into an other category, and that's about 8% of the calls we get. So the next several slides are photos of um, enforcement cases that we've had this year. In fact, all of the photos that I'll show you tonight have, ha have occurred in this fiscal year. And here's an example of commercial washing, and admittedly this is a pretty um, atypical example of commercial washing. Um, we don't typically see super sudsy discharges. Um, more commonly, we'll see um, um, just uh, dirty looking water, muddy water in the street, or um, heavily sedimented water. 
But in this particular case, this was a, a restaurant washing off a, a patio. Unfortunately, this, is, this doesn't occur very often, but this is a grease, a grease spill that was on the beach. And um, we got a report of people with walking on the beach that had some grease on their shoes. And upon investigation, we found that the seagrass on a certain stretch of beach had this pink, greasy substance. And just upstream from there was some heavy equipment on the beach. And although we couldn't conclusively tie the discharge from that heavy equipment to the seagrass that we found, um, we did talk to the contractor to make sure that, that they're not over applying their, um, their joints with that red grease, which um, coincidentally does turn pink when it gets wet. Here's an example of a, a paint spill. Um, a contractor washed out some paint in the gutter. And the photo on the right shows the response from the fire department and the emergency service worker that was able to get there immediately and throw some absorbent down and block off that storm drain so there was no discharge to the storm drain. Here's another construction related discharge. Um, this was a contractor that washed out some paint into a drop inlet that they thought went to the sewer, but instead it went to the street. Um, unfortunately, it did occur after hours, so uh, the, the paint remained in the, in the street overnight, and the photo on the left shows where uh, people had driven through it overnight. But uh, fortunately, on this one, um, there wasn't enough to actually make it into a drain, and the contractor was able to get there and power wash it and capture that water and get it all cleaned up the next day. Here's an example of a construction site where they didn't um, deliberately put the sediment into the street like this, but with all the vehicle traffic in and out, it was tracked into the street. And any type of incidental flow of water um, is going to carry all that to the, to the drain in the creek. Another construction-related discharge where a, um, a contractor washed out some remaining stucco slurry and made quite a mess. And in this one, the, the homeowner um, was required to power wash and capture the water to clean it up. This is a chart showing a summary of our enforcement data from the last five fiscal years, including this one. So far this fiscal year through the end of May, we've had 199 calls. Um, we've issued 72 notices of violation or warning letters and um, seven citations. Um, and, and you can see from this that the objective of our program is not necessarily punitive, but more educational in nature. Um, we've issued 72 notices of violation warning letters and only seven repeat offense, offenses. So what we generally see is, is people um, creating discharges and they don't really think about where, where the water's going. Um, I don't really think there's a, a, deliberately, a deliberate intent to discharge it to the storm drain. Um, it's just, a, it's just a, an attitude of, you know, it's away from me, we're cleaning it up. But you know, that's our objective, is to, to keep that from happening again. So another part of the enforcement program is to uh, clean up illegal dumping and encampment sites. We rarely find the, the person that's responsible for these sorts of things, but we can always, we can always get it cleaned up. We receive reports from residents and other city staff. However, about 95% of the sites that we find for cleanup are discovered by Creeks Division staff, whether through their, their work in the creek on other projects or through the investigation of, of hotspots. We have certain sites where we know when we go to, we're likely to see an encampment or um, some trash that was dumped. There's many sites that are our hotspots along Mission Creek, but um, we see specific sites at Laguna Channel, Sycamore Creek, and Royal Borough, um, like um, at Chase Palm Park, at the, at the railroad along Laguna Channel, at the railroad near Sycamore Creek, and near the lagoon and the Douglas Family Preserve at Arroyo Borough. And I'll show you some photos from this year of um, illegal dumping and encampments. This is along Mission Creek under Talent. A couple people camping there. Another encampment along Mission Creek under the bridge at Ariaga Street. A case of illegal dumping off the new Ortega Bridge along Mission Creek. This is just some household trash. 
This is a photo from Sycamore Creek at the Cacique footbridge. We had a problem earlier this year with repeated dumping at this site. Um, it seemed every week we were getting this sort of thing. And this is a picture from about a block down at Indio Muerte with some illegal, illegal, illegal dumping. And I was able to go through this trash bag here and found a couple pieces of trash, a prescription pill bottle, and some Costco coupons with the gentleman's name on it. And we forwarded that information to a code enforcement officer and uh, environmental services. And they, were, they sent an NOV and required cleanup of this trash. And it, you know, it may be a coincidence, but um, we, we stopped seeing the weekly dumping at Cacique after that. Here's a large pile of trash at the Arroyo Borough campment from last summer. Uh, there was a group of campers there that had a very well-hidden campsite that we discovered and um, did multiple cleanups to, to remove all the trash that they left behind near the creek. This is at the Sycamore Creek site just downstream of the railroad. It's got a really nice pad for a camp, um, and we see a lot of mattresses there. Um, and encampments there as well. And you might notice the, the white piece of paper on the mattress, and that is our cleanup notice. We, it's city policy to provide a 48-hour cleanup notice to occupied encampments, and this gives occupants a chance to remove any possessions they value before we come in and, and take, uh, take, take things, clean it up. After 48 hours, the items that we find at these encampments are either taken to the police station or parks and rec, or um, to Marburg for recycling or the landfill, just depending on the value of the items that we find. This is the cleanup notice up close. We, we post it with the time and date up top, and then when we're going to do the cleanup, um, the approximate time and the location of our cleanup. And it's just a, a general statement that um, you know, your items need to be removed and anything remaining over $50 will be taken to the police department and remaining at this location can result in a, an arrest or citation. Uh, my phone number is also on there in case someone gets the notice and, and has any questions. If you know, We had a case recently where um, someone left a backpack and um, I got a call r immediately after the cleanup and uh, I was able to get that backpack right back to the person. Because we, we don't want to take people's stuff. You know, we, we just want to get it cleaned up. It's something to care about, we don't want to take it. So. Our contractor charges us $102 per creek or beach site cleanup, and this is regardless of what's there. 102 bucks, flat fee, they take everything they find. So far this fiscal year, we've had 844 sites cleaned up, and it's been around 106,000 pounds of trash removed for an average of about 126, 000, uh, 126 pounds per site. And here's a summary of of what the contractors found. They, they track everything for us, and um, they have certain categories that they look for. So 69 bicycles, 96 grocery carts, 66 mattresses, 543 paint cans, 16 appliances, 166 blankets or other types of bedding, 120 pieces of furniture, 220 plastic bags, and 130 sites where there was some type of feces. Whether it's dog or human, it's not. Um, it's not differentiated by our contractor, but they, they count it. And this includes the creek banks, and it also includes trash receptacles near creek banks. So people that, that dump furniture items next to a trash can, will, they'll take that as well. This last photo is of one encampment near Sycamore Creek south of the railroad station, um, and it was over 1,000 pounds of trash at this site. So you know, I mentioned earlier that it's a little over 100 pounds per site, encampment sites can really skew our uh, average cleanup per site. So that's the end of the presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for that presentation. It's hard to imagine a more direct, uh, I guess, use of funds to help clean up creeks than uh, <laughs> the removal that you just described. Are there any comments or questions from the committee? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd like to Second, your observation. I, I know at the council meetings, at the Chamber of Commerce uh, meetings, we often hear, well, you know, the restoration and the steelhead salmon and stuff is great, but uh, 
is Measure B actually being used to clean up the creeks and the watersheds and make the creeks and the beaches cleaner? And I think this kind of detailed report um, with specifics as well as a synopsis of all the different creeks and all the different litter and trash and pollution that you're collecting is exactly the kind of information that I know the public at large um, and various community organizations are always asking about, you know, what, what are we actually using the money for to clean up the creeks? And so uh, I want to thank you again for a very focused, detailed summary. Thank you. Yes. Um, are um, you responsible for checking the Hendry's Beach area, um, not, not just the creek that dumps into the sea uh, or the channel, but along that beach area, or is that county? Yeah, by the lagoon. Yeah, we do check that area. You That's... check the lagoon, but further down the beach at all? In the county side, we don't check that area. Okay. Cause yeah. Only only the, the section that's in within the city limits. I don't know where the limit is. Yeah, it's, the it's beach. pretty much right at the lifeguard stand there. So east of the lifeguard stand is the city. Uh, there's a sign about on-leash pets or off-leash pets. That's, that's kind of the, the that's designation. That's the dividing we, line. Okay, thank at. you. Ms. Lomas? Thank you. I have two questions. Um, how often do you do these cleanups? Um, how often does one particular creek get cleaned up, or is it just site-specific? And uh, do you also coordinate with volunteers, like during Creek Week or anything like that, to get another cleanup in there, or yeah, our, volunteers rather than paying? Yeah, we do. Our outreach coordinator um, coordinates a lot of our cleanups, and they mainly focus on the beach sites. But we're in constant communication, and I know they have some coming up, so we won't clean up a beach right before that or, or right after it. So, you know, we are getting, you know, the, the, free, the free labor, so to speak. But as far as uh, the types of sites that we're cleaning and how frequent we are, um, it is pretty site-specific, but um, we also will we'll hit the beaches every week. We have five beach sites that we clean up. Um, we clean up from, uh, on, from Mission Lagoon all the way to Ledbetter. Um, and that's three sites that are broken up by our contractor. And then we also clean up um, from the Sycamore Creek Lagoon to Calle Cesar Chavez along the beach there. So we found that um, it's, it's about 200 pounds of trash per site on the beaches. Uh, it's a lot of encampments and also clothing and, and heavier materials there. Um, recently, yeah. So I would just say, so on the, along the beach, along the shoreline, we're, uh, we have the contractor out there once a week. So they're out every Friday. And some of the creek locations, contra the contractor's out two, sometimes three times a week. Um, there are some kind of hot spots that mostly near bridges and mostly near bridges that are located near a convenience store. Uh, you just find more trash there. And so we've got uh, contractors down there. And the, uh, as far as um, volunteer cleanups, we do beach cleanups and uh, creek cleanups. The reason we focus on, on the beaches is it's, it's easier to work with a crowd of volunteers at the beaches, but also a lot of the creek, uh, creek beds and creek banks in the city are privately owned, and so we don't take a group of volunteers and through somebody's yard basically to do the cleanup. Uh, but we will send a contractor in there if there's trash to be removed from there. But there are the public sections of the creeks, and we know exactly where those are. So if some, if some group specifically wants to do a creek cleanup, we can, we've got locations that we can take them to. A couple of questions about the, the phone number and the way to contact you and report a leak. It, one, how do, you know, how would the average citizen know necessarily how to report it? Because I, I don't know what the first thought would be if you see something spilling that looks like it shouldn't be spilling, might be to just contact the police department. And two, is there a way to report it online? And what steps do we take to publicize the ways to report? And then if it isn't a severe after hours spill, what would you recommend somebody do? Um, well, you know, the one thing they can always do is if it's after hours, you can call 911. Um, and I would encourage anyone to call if they see, see any type of flow in the street. You know, a lot of times you might see water in the street that looks kind of clean, but it can always be a pool discharge. Um, 
you know, you just never know. And we're happy to, to investigate regardless of, of what it is. So, you know, I, I would encourage people to, to call, be, you know, be on the safe side and just go ahead and call. Um, and you mentioned how, how would people know to call us. We do some outreach. Um, we have our phone number on all of the storm drain screen markers, um, a lot of the screen, storm drain markers. Um, um, and on our website, uh, um, the New City's website, there's going to be a way to electronically report pollution, and that will come directly to my email and also our outreach coordinator. Thank you. We've, Ms. We, we'll just, uh, we, just, we've, we do uh, regular trainings with all of the city staff, so what happens is people don't know exactly who to call. They'll call into somebody in the city, and then uh, so one of the things we've really worked on is making sure people in the city know to contact Jim's number. And, um, and we have worked with the police department with regard to uh, 911. If, if people see something coming out, if they think it's an emergency, they should call 911. And uh, we've cleared that with the PD and the fire department and, and the dispatchers, um, particularly with regard to sewage spills, uh, you know, some kind of chemical spill, anything like that. Uh, the, the fire department is the first responder to something like that, and then um, we'll come in after the fact. And we've we've really worked out the details of, you know, uh, who's responsible for incident command, who's responsible for the cleanup, and uh, we've Jim spent a lot of time with all the different city departments so that we could take care of any kind of spill day or night and be prepared for that. Thank you. Yes, Miss French. Uh, Jim, would you give us just a little bit more background on what happened on Saturday night? Because there was a lot of sediment on the street. Yeah. And, um, you know, I didn't call because I saw city personnel out there, but there was a lot uh, covering that whole block. Right, yeah. So for, it, was a, it was a water main break. And what happens during a water main break is in order to get to it, the pipe that broke to fix it, they have to dig up the street. And there's a lot of sediment that gets discharged. And um, we've worked with, with water resources, and they know to block the storm drains off and to limit the sediment that gets in the drain. And I, it's really difficult to stop all that sediment, and we know that what, that what they do isn't perfect, but they try really hard to prevent as much sediment as they can from uh, getting in that drain. And on Monday, we got a report that there's a lot of sediment in the drain, and there's city workers you know, doing something at the intersection of Laguna and Cana Perdido. Mm -hmm. And I went out and talked to those guys and just reminded them, you know, hey, you know, when you clean this up, because they'll power wash the street or they'll wash the street afterwards and try to clean it up. Um, you know, you got to be really careful about the cleanup to keep the, the sediment out of the street. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we know, we know, we know. But, you know, it's always good to, to give them a reminder. They were shoveling it up and trying to capture as much sediment as they could. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the yeah. committee? Yes, please. Councilmember Hatchett, thank you. Um, if, if some of the effluent we saw here looked like water-based paint, maybe white paint, is that a pollutant, or is that a pollutant thing, or is it just a discoloration? Yeah, it's no, that's definitely a pollutant, and it's you know prohibited by our municipal code. Um, any type of paint would be prohibited. Um, for water-based paint, it would be better to. Um, you know, spread it on the landscaping, lay it out to dry first, and put it in a, a trash receptacle. Um, I would say it's probably not the best to put it down the sewer, but that would be preferable to putting it in the street. Can you pour it in your garden? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't I'm not a, a botanist, but I wouldn't want to put it on any plants that I cared about. Um, but uh, it on the ground and let it filter down. I think that would be a, a much better solution than, than putting it into the street or the storm drain. Cars and people walking in and out just leaves mud or whatever. Are we considering that a pollutant? You talked about it being, we were talking about sediment. Sediment to some degree is obviously a natural product of life itself. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's, it's dirt. But our municipal code is very restrictive. And it talks about, um, it doesn't call us sediment specifically, but it's, it's, a, it's a pollutant that we consider um, to be significant to water quality. And it's not named specifically. Okay. I don't think pollutant is accurate. Go ahead, please. Uh, the sediment from a construction site like that would violate the erosion control uh, requirements for any kind of construction as well. 
I was doing some quick calculations uh, from the times the number of the expense to get people out to the sites. And it came up with uh, eighty-six thousand dollars. Is that about right? What we're paying to—it's pretty close. Yeah, it's pretty close to you know about one hundred and two dollars per site. So, yeah, we've got a so far this year we've got a. I think we're going to be on target for about ninety-five that we're going to spend with that contractor. Uh, that's relatively constant. Uh, you know what we're able to do is put additional pressure onto locations. So as we're as we're able to keep some of the trash out of out of locations, for example, through the storm drain screens that we've put on, we've been monitoring the trash that's getting into storm drains. That's going down, but we we have dumping. But we've taken on new locations. So at the request of um, at the request of some members of the community, for example, we've started cleaning along the shoreline of the beach where uh, we hadn't been we hadn't been doing any trash pickup before. We didn't really think, we thought things were kind of washing away, but what you see is things are coming up onto the beach uh, from the ocean. So we did as a, we started as a pilot program uh, to go out once a week and pick up trash on the beach, and we found that we were collecting quite a bit of trash out there. So we've expanded, we've expanded that program. So the dollar amount has stayed roughly the same, just under $100,000 a year. Forgive me for addressing At least our campsites, if we can call them that, are seasonal. They're probably more popular or more populated uh, May to October. I, I would say they are more populated during the summer months, the nicer months, but we, deal, we do still find them during the winter as well. Right, because I've seen recently a real influx. I don't know if you, that's reached the camp encampment level yet, but around town it's been a sizable influx in the last two, three weeks. Hmm. Question: You haven't seen, been able to detect that yet. Again. No, not not yet. I mean, so far this this year we've had 33 encampments that we've cleaned up that we found. And that's about going up. I I'd say that. I would just anecdotally, I think that's probably higher this year than previous years. Well, either there are more encampments, or we're doing a better job. It could be. Yeah, we're we, we're we're finding more and more hot spots, and you know we know better where to look as time goes on. I would just add that with regard to public health and water quality, the encampments are a really serious problem for us. That's where, you know, we, we have most of the human waste that they're picking up out of the creeks is coming from encampments. And right, and I know that's sometimes a, you misinterpreted that to think it was runoff from normal re regular residences and the laterals, et cetera, at one point that was a fear. But well, I think we've we've seen some evidence of, we've seen plenty of evidence of leaking laterals getting into the creeks, and that's a... You know, the difference there is is the leaking lateral is a constant source as compared to uh, because people are using those bathrooms all year long, all the time, um, as compared to encampments, which are transient and, and temporary locations. So, you you know, we'll have that we'll have that situation in a creek where we find an encampment. We find a lot of human waste. We get that cleaned up. We monitor the site after that for a period of time to just to make sure that people don't just come right back. Uh, with a leaking lateral, it's very hard to detect, and you can have that happening for, you know, where you're getting one or two gallons a minute of flow, uh, say, from a commercial lateral that can go on for years or decades. So for uh, And, and you have a pretty loud voice. <laughs> anyway, is your number an appropriate number to call for uh, an encampment report? If the encampment is under a bridge or near, near a creek, certainly. Uh, if it's... People may not make that distinction, but you can refer calls elsewhere. If that's Absolutely, yeah. If, if, if people want to call my number, I can always get it to the right person. Thank you, Thank you very much for your mm -hmm. and, and And what is that number again? Eight nine seven two six eight eight. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Any further discussion based on um, anything that Councilmember Hotchkiss raised, or any other questions for our presenter?
Yes, Ms. Lomas. I would like to um, attempt to biologically answer the sediment question, if I may. Um, sediment is a natural process in creeks, but a lot of it is the timing and the season. Um, when we're having rain events, all the organisms are used to hunkering down when we have a high sediment load coming through our creeks, and then the sediment drops out and the flows subside, and that's when all the resources start to lay eggs. And if all of a sudden you have another slew of sediment, whether it's a natural product or not, it can um, cover uh, steelhead eggs that are, have to be laid in gravels, so it will just smother them and the eggs will not get the oxygen they need to develop. Or frog eggs can also be um, smothered with the muds. So it's really, sediment is a very critical thing biologically. It may not be toxic, but it's, it can be lethal biologically. And again, it's the season and the amount that is the question. And what relevance do the eggs have on the health of the creeks? Well, it does degrade the water quality, but that's all tied to dissolved oxygen and um, the reproductive cycle of the aquatics. Um, dissolved oxygen is a big um, component to that. Yeah, I would just add that in, an, in addition to that, in an urban setting, uh, a lot of the pollutants that we have, um, hydrocarbons, bacteria, and so forth, will absorb themselves to sediment. So they, they'll attach themselves to sediment. So as sediment is, is pushed across an urban landscape, it will tend to pick up those pollutants and then bring them into a creek environment where you, you wouldn't necessarily have those in a, in a natural creek environment. Any further discussion? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we uh, move to adjournment. Um, time, time and place for the next meeting. <clears throat> I know we're August 21st. It should be the 17th, I believe. The 3rd is a Wednesday. Okay. So the next meeting will be um, July 17th at 5.30. We're going to, actually the next two meetings, we're going to be going outside and doing some site visits. So the next meeting we're planning to go out to the uh, project we're working on in Mission Creek at the Caltrans channels, take a look at that. Um, the contractor there is making uh, you know, pretty significant progress. He's, he's done a lot of different design uh, work to how he's, he's constructing the fish passage project there. It's pretty interesting to check out, very different from the contractor that we had before. Um, so we're going out there for the July 17th meeting. We'll meet at, at the uh, Parks and Rec uh, administrati administrative offices at 620 Laguna. And then on August 21st, we're going to be having a joint meeting with the Creeks Advisory Committee and the Parks and Recreation Commission. And uh, that meeting will begin at 5.30. We're going to meet at the Parks and Recreation Administrative Office, and we're going to go check out the uh, three stormwater infiltration projects that we have under construction. We're hoping that the Stevens Park project will be completed by then, maybe the Westside Neighborhood Center, and we'll be working on Oak Park, and that will be... Uh, that will be demoed and, and um, they'll be in a construction mode on that. And so we get to see several different phases of those projects while they're under construction. Uh, Madam Chair, would you accept a motion to adjourn? Accept it. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Now that warmer weather is here, we check.